But if you'll first join me in the blessing that we say whenever we study, it ends with the words la asok. Everybody say la asok. Bidivre. Bidivre. Torah. But not before Bert Wolf comes in. Bert, you're not interrupting us. Um, so you know the first part, we're all going to get to do a mitzvah. Because by coming tonight and learning, um, it's... It's 3.30 in the morning in Tel Aviv right now. Uh, my favorite professor from my two years living in Israel just got off the plane. A few hours ago, Jan Reisman brought him to his hotel. We just had a rushed dinner. And during dinner, I got excited not just about tonight, but about tomorrow lunch, about tomorrow evening, about Sunday. Tonight is the first of five talks that Professor Paul Lips will be offering us. In case you don't know Paul Lips, uh, he is a social historian. His career, uh, I know he's a humble, modest man and father and grandfather of 10, but you may have heard about him if you knew about the Department of Middle Eastern and African History at Tel Aviv University. You know about him if you were a rabbi at the Hebrew Union College, Rabbi Grossman, Rabbi Bowman, I learned with him 28 years ago. It's hard to believe that. He's the, he was the education director of the World Union for Progressive Judaism's Education Center. He's published many articles on contemporary Jewry and Jewish history. He just came back from leading a group of 30 through Spain and studying Spanish Jewish history. Um, he has lectured and conducted workshops. At last count, I counted 13 countries. There may be more that he'll inform us of. Um, in addition, he's traveled throughout Europe with numerous groups, and he's recognized as an outstanding scholar in residence. There are lots of great professors. There are many great scholars who are full of knowledge. But I think those of you in the teaching profession would agree that transmitting that knowledge and being able to provide frames to understand complex issues uh, is a gift, and that is his gift. Without further ado, and I urge you not only to enjoy and be challenged by tonight's talk, tomorrow evening at 6.15, he will deliver the sermonette, followed by a dinner you're all invited to We'll be discussing Judaism in the Jewish state. On Sunday morning, um, Yom HaShoah, uh, how the Holocaust still informs the landscape and the people of Israel. It's my pleasure to welcome, literally, direct from Tel Aviv to Memphis, Professor Paul Lips. Thank you. Good evening. Um, this is my thing, I'm here, and not my last. So, you should know in advance. Um, it's lovely to be here. It's a short visit uh, to, to the States. I'm uh, here and I leave on Sunday. But there are a lot of things going on in Israel all the time. Um, but what I'd like to do tonight is to try and deal with some of the important issues of what's happening in Israel. Um, and then leave a lot of time for your questions uh, and, and comments. Uh, and if I disagree with you, I'll just leave the room. Uh, <laughs> but please say whatever you want, ask all the questions you want, because basically uh, uh, the, the only way we can deal with Israel is to deal with Israel where, uh, what we feel in our hearts. And uh, we're talking about a, an amazing event of Jewish history. Uh, 
Um, I arrived in Israel one day before the Six Day War. Uh, it was intentional, not that the war I was so interested in, but once I knew that a war was going to happen, um, and living in the small country of Rhodesia, and nowadays Zimbabwe, and uh, uh, a message came from the Jewish agency in Jerusalem, and the request, the, I never forget the telegram. The telegram said uh, a war is going to break out. Uh, Israel at that time was only 19 years old, a very small and relatively weak country. And the appeal was for people to, to go and help. And you know, we make decisions in our lives. We often wonder whether they're the right decisions or not. Um, but I've made a few very good decisions. Uh, that was a good decision. And meeting my wife was a very good decision. And having wonderful students and teaching was a very good decision. And tied up with that, living in Israel for now 47 years is a challenge. It, uh, you wake up in the morning and ask very important questions. We're just, just going towards, we just finished Pesach, where we deal with the question of leaving Egypt to search for freedom. And we've got Yom HaShoah, Holocaust, and then we have Memorial Day, and then we have Independence Day. So as an Israeli living, being in Israel for this period of time uh, is, is very powerful and very emotional. I want to start off because I'm going to be speaking about the challenges. I want to start off with speaking about the good news. Because um, Jews are very, very good at speaking about the bad news. Uh, I, I was very fortunate to have wonderful educators in my life. And one of the most important educators was my wife's uh, grandmother who passed away many years ago. She was very much part of the Lithuanian background and some of the tragedies that happened to Jews. And she was living in Israel for a number of years and I used to speak to her. And every time that I was kind of optimistic about the Jewish future and Jewish events, she would say, Oy vei gewalt, that basically said, don't be naive and happy. And we had this unbelievable generational love of each other, where her life was very much, oh, some terrible things are happening. And my life in Israel has been a life of some wonderful things that have happened. And therefore, that is the combination of what I'd like to speak about uh, tonight. I want to start off with some of the real good things that are happening in Israel. And you know, uh, I'm in the States uh, two or three times a year. I, I'm exposed to the American media like you people are. Um, I, I'm amazed how often uh, the good things about Israel are totally forgotten. I mean, I think if I only looked at Israel through the medium of the New York Times and the, the international CNN, uh, you know, I'd wonder how anyone actually lives there. But I think it's important. I mean, it's very important, while at the same time, going into some of the, the real issues that we still have to deal with in that country, just to put out some of the uh, other components. You know, some years ago, Israel became a member of the best and most important club in the world. The club is called the OECD. Uh, it's the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, where there are 26 countries that belong to it. Now, this is an elite club. I don't have to tell you Israel's international status and our power in the world isn't so great that we can convince the most important countries of the world to invite us into the club. So when they invited us into the club, it said something. However, I've learned something very important about being a member of a club. Don't go to a club where most people are going to be better off than you, because you're going to spend most of your life being depressed. And as soon as we became a member of this 26 member club, of highly successful countries, none of whom have anywhere near the challenges that we have. And we in Israel look at our OECD status and we constantly see we're at the end of the 26 members. And I'm always pointing out to my Israeli colleagues, if we're number 25 in the OECD, we're also number 25 in the world of 196 countries, and that's not so bad for a new little country in the Middle East. So the context of our analysis really has to be a new member of the developed world, and without wanting to be too statistical, just to take three or four components. 
we are considered as a country, not only in terms of the OECD, to be number 25 in terms of quality of life. Living in Israel, I'm sure many of you are aware of it, our incomes are about half or third of what they are in the United States. So we don't have a lot of money in, a, in the general sense. But we do very, very well in terms of quality of life. What is quality of life? Quality of life is family relationships, friendship relationships, health schemes, and education schemes. And there are another 19 components which I won't go into now. We have a wonderful, wonderful human environment. And uh, just to speak on a personal level, um, we live in Jerusalem um, about an hour and a half from two of our children and uh, their six children. Our uh, grandchildren think we're terrible grandparents. How can we live so far away from them? And we only see them once or twice a week. So we've been going through this very problematic family crisis. And people, when we talk about the challenges facing Israel, I'm going to tell you the challenges facing the family are much greater. And now we are really thinking very seriously of moving to be what they want is 10 minutes from us. Because that makes for caring grandparents. And the situation in Israel generally of this interaction of the family is very important. By the way, I, I personally studied 25 countries in the world. I learned a long time ago that loving family doesn't mean you love each other. <laughs> you can be very angry with each other, but you care for each other. And in Israel, because we have to be honest, things can go bad. We don't know what tomorrow is. Uh, when I arrived there one day before the Sixth Day War, uh, we didn't know what, I, none of us knew what was going to happen. In fact, we didn't know the name of the war because it was an unusual war, changed its name every day. One day war, two day war, three day war, four day. It was a very Jewish war. It ended up six days, so we could have a day of rest uh, afterwards. But it was really a very remarkable situation in Israel as one of the ways of coping with the challenges which we do face as a society to have this very, very strong uh, family uh, environment. In a small country, it's obviously easier than in a large country. Friendship levels are very, very strong. I found starting to teach at Tel Aviv University many years ago that the, uh, the relationship between my students was very powerful. And I just want to give you a, a very small anecdote which really had a, had a, a big impact on me. Um, after a few years of teaching at the university, there was a case study of uh, uh, the final examination, end of the third year program that I was involved in, of uh, a, a, one of the students having given his answer sheet to another student. Now, I know in American university that would be considered unacceptable behavior. In Israel, we consider that as a good topic for discussion. See, we have different concepts of behavior. So we brought in the student. He was actually a wonderful student. And we said, you know, what, what did you do? And he said, I did a terrible thing. So then we said, if you know it was a terrible thing, why did you do it? And he said, that guy who I handed the answer sheet to, he was a friend of mine. And he spent the last three months serving in the Israeli army. He was called up for extended reserve service. And then he said, you know, I'm prepared to accept any punishment you give me, but I did the right thing. And I gave the answer sheet to someone who I had to help. And I think it's a very important component in our complex society where even though we disagree with each other on so many issues, and I'll be talking about that, our ability and desire with which comes to show to help each other, although it doesn't always appear to that from the media, is something which I found very important. And just to be optimistic for a bit, because I'll get you to press a little later, um, was the um, health scheme. Uh, I don't want to compare it with any other country of the world, and particularly not where I am at this moment. But we essentially have health schemes available for everyone. 5% um, of our incomes go to health. Uh, the very wealthy pay a fortune amount of money for the health of the rest of the population. And the reason they do it is that I've spoken to these people. I say, don't you object giving funding the health scheme of the country? And they say, no. 
because if the country is healthy, we are healthy. These are very important comments that sometimes you hear. And the last comment, just in terms of education, is that we sent our four children to study uh, at Israeli universities. We paid their tuition fees. We've never allowed them to forget it. And um, what did it cost us? Our most expensive child, our child number two, um, it cost about um, $4,000 a year for a world-level university. So we have in Israel, with all the other things, and the other points are as important, some very, very important components. Economically, we are a thriving community. Economically, not only are we thriving in terms of income, we have 70% of the population are living on a very, very comfortable level, although we all complain because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be who we are. We have to complain as well, otherwise, you know, we would have learned nothing from my uh, wife's grandmother. Um, but uh, it really is a, a kind of an amazing achievement. In the situation that we find ourselves, in the complex migratory process which Israel has gone through, um, to be able to have given a radically improved life to so many of our population who came not from the comfortable parts of the world, but from the very difficult parts of the world is important. That's my point number one. We have gained, we have moved forward, we have done some very important things in terms of lifestyle. The second point, and I've been amazed by it. You know, I remember when the Ethiopian Jews arrived in Israel. We live in Jerusalem. And just down from where we were living uh, is the Diplomat Hotel, where suddenly overnight we heard that people were coming from Ethiopia. We hardly knew where Ethiopia was. I happen to know it because I'm from Africa. But most Israelis really know that they were Ethiopian Jews. And they arrived. And I'll never forget the radio broadcast the next day. So many Israelis had turned up, realizing that these Ethiopians had arrived without clothing. They would literally been picked up at the Addis Ababa airport and brought to Israel. There is the whole of Israel, it looked like, had brought clothes so the Ethiopians would have clothes. But the beginning, the, the first statement on the radio broadcast at lunchtime one o'clock broadcast was, if you are giving any shoes, please tie the laces so the shoes will not be separate. Because it was found on the second morning, people were walking around with shoes of totally different sets, colors and tie, and, 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 and design. So they thought, I mean, the least you could do is tie the shoes together so the people uh, would have it. It hasn't been easy. But look where we are. The Jews of France are going through a tremendous crisis at the moment. They've got a home to come to. I hope it doesn't happen. But looking at what's going on in Ukraine at the moment, who knows? And you know, it's a remarkable moment of human history, and certainly of Jewish history. But let's take the Jewish component just for a moment. I would say for the first time in Jewish history, a destitute Jew has a home to go to. That has not happened at any moment in the past. And as a Jewish historian, realizing that something, and I hope it doesn't happen, can happen in Crimea, or in Kiev, or in Odessa, or in any other part, of a distressed part of the world. And today, for the first time in history, those people can get up and leave and come to Israel. By the way, they don't have to stay in Israel. We know from the Argentinian economic crisis several years ago, many Argentinians were totally destitute, living in Buenos Aires. They came to Israel, and Israel accepted them and fed them and housed them, and some stayed and some went back, and that's okay. And so sometimes I think we have to, real, have to have a real sense of what this project of the State of Israel is really all about. It's a labor of love. By the way, a labor of love which couldn't have happened just by those 
between us who live in Israel. This was a labor of love because of the support of all of you and everyone who lives in any part of the world has been part of one just darn difficult project where not too long ago someone had said one day there will be a Jewish state. The answer would be, you're a Meshuggah, you're a crazy person. How can you ever think it can happen? And it's actually happened. I just wanted to tell you about a little letter that I once read. When I arrived in Israel in 1967, it, and because I hadn't studied there, I, was, I wanted to get as much as I could the sense of the 19 years of Israeli history that I hadn't experienced. So when my Hebrew permitted me, I started going to the Hebrew press. And I read a letter in one of the Israeli newspapers. It was written on the first anniversary of the modern state of Israel. Very short little letter. And the letter said the following. This is the most wonderful day of my life. Israel is now one year old. And in two weeks time, we're going to say, this is the most wonderful day of my life. Israel is uh, 66 years old. So this, these are the things which I think are uh, terribly important. Let's deal with the challenges. Let's start with the macro and then move to the micro. At any moment of history, there have been certain regions which have been faced by major, major crises. If you look at the history of Europe 150 years ago, it was chaos killing, the killing fields of Europe, and I often tour that area, the rabbi pointed out I've just recently come back from Spain, but I go to Europe with groups on many occasions. Sometimes I'm walking through Europe, and you know, at a certain moment, I just look down at the soil of Europe, and I say, how many people lost their lives in that bit of Europe that I'm walking? I say this because I'm going to make some tough comments about the Middle East. But it's not because of the Middle East per se. It's about the tragic component of human history, which has been so filled by distress and anger and uh, some very, very awful behavior. The Middle East is going through a very, very difficult moment uh, at the present time. There's an article which uh, Tony Blair, former uh, British Prime Minister uh, wrote, it was written in the British uh, newspaper, The New Spectator, um, which actually appears in, the, in some other newspapers today, where he speaks about the crisis of radical Islam. Let me make a comment about radical Islam. I think it's, it's dangerous for us to see the world of Islam as radical. It isn't. It's a world filled with many, many nuances, different kind of Islams. But what often happens when, when an ideology or theology is going through crisis, the radical, the negative groups dominate. And that, in a sense, is what's happening with Islam at the moment. And whenever one looks through the Middle East at the various countries, there's sometimes a very small percentage, by the way, 10% of any society which is committed to destruction is stronger in many cases than the 90%. One of the tragedies of history, the power, the negative power of small groups, just as sometimes there's a positive power of small groups. We know it from so many situations in America as well. But at the moment of Islamic history, the negative power of that 10% is having such a destructive effect on the whole region, it's absolutely tragic. Look what's happening in just a few of the 23 countries of the Middle East. Iraq, who knows if Iraq will remain as one Iraq. The southern Shiite Arabs, who are in conflict with the central Sunni Arabs, who are in conflict with the northern Sunni Kurds. That's the story of Iraq. Very tragic. And you know, we hardly read Iraqi news anymore. And the reason is because the numbers of deaths there has exceeded the level that we can really cope with. And it's been going on for years. 
but it's a tragic, tragic society. Syria. Look what's happening in Syria. And I want to tell you, I deal a great deal with Middle Eastern issues. Someone ever said to me, you know, Paul, come and help us deal with the Syrian problem. I'd say, you know, I've just one holiday in New Zealand for about 20 years. It is an absolutely impossible situation. You don't know who you want to support, and you don't know what the implications of the support are. What we do know, and we have to understand some very important things that are happening in the world today, is that the Assad government is supported by Russia, and the opposition has no support. Now, I'm not convinced that the opposition are all of the best people in the world, but there's an imbalance which is very interesting. And the Middle East is therefore going into a period not only of where there are internal conflicts, but the certain countries of the world are going to be activists. And Russia is going to be one of the most activist countries in the world. We see it in Ukraine. And because the Western world is in going through its own issues and its own confusion of what is a good idea and what isn't, there's a tremendous imbalance. And therefore, the reports of the last three days that Assad is once again using chemical uh, um, the mechanisms of, of killing his own population. There is absolutely no opposition force against it. So Assad may once again come out the winner and many, many people will die. Lebanon, and unfortunately, um, the Lebanon is one, really one of the, the, the tragic countries in the world. I was in Lebanon in 1982 as an uninvited guest uh, of the Israeli army. So I, I have a kind of personal relationship um, uh, with Lebanon. But it is, it's, it's an hour and a half away from civil war. The Hezbollah Shiites of Lebanon are fighting for Assad uh, in, in Syria. The whole breakup, the whole inability of Lebanon as a country to really form itself with a collective identity is, um, is very, very powerful. And in a few minutes, I just want to tell one or two uh, stories of my experience in, in Lebanon. Uh, Libya is in danger uh, of breaking up. Uh, Algeria has unbelievable tension between the Muslim forces and the military forces. Egypt, we know uh, there was the Arab Spring, which unfortunately is looking like a very muddy winter. Um, I, I was uh, a scholar in, um, on the West Coast in January 2011, and everyone was delighted that the Arab Spring was coming. And I said, just, we'll know what it's about in several months' time. And unfortunately, my fears and skepticism proved to be correct. It hasn't been much of a spring. It's been a very, very uh, sad uh, situation. So the Middle East is in a tough moment of its history. Like all other regions, it will work itself out. From an Israeli perspective, it's not a great part of the world to be in. And you know, I, I'm a dreamer. Um, and I often dream what would happen if I ever met Abraham and Moses. And they would say, you should be happy. We, uh, you, the chosen people, uh, I've given you the promised land. Um, the Bar Torah of tomorrow evening, to Shem, the holy land. And I would say to them, if I had the opportunity, um, well, um, you know, uh, uh, chosen people, well, that's a difficult issue. But promised land, uh, maybe New Zealand. Uh, what promised land were we given? When I arrived in Israel in 1967, it was a bunch of sand and some very enthusiastic people. And uh, now it's just different. It's different every day. Um, but it really is uh, living, being in the Middle East, not, that doesn't make it easy. Makes it difficult. Makes it difficult for us, uh, those of us living in Israel, and it makes it very, very tragic for the people of, of the Middle East. And I, I have a great deal of sympathy for Middle Easterners today, by the way, who are caught in these impossible situations of identity and loyalties and tribalism and all these issues you know, the Middle East is potentially the richest part of the world. But it acts in some ways, and for many of the people, it's one of the poorest parts of the world. So it's a very, very tough moment uh, in terms of um, Middle Eastern history. Um, so that's a challenge for Israel. 
we are in this tough Palestinian-Israeli issue. I meet uh, State Department people every now and again. And uh, I always like to meet them, and I always say that after meeting them, uh, why didn't I bring a, a bottle of vodka with me as well? Because I'll tell you how the conversation goes. And it's always a particular level. They sit down, they meet me, and they meet me because um, they have to get a, a 101 sense of what's going on in the Middle East. And apparently I have some abilities at explaining uh, some of these complex issues. Um, and they say something like the following. They say, well, we've been being, uh, given instructions by the State Department that we would like you Israelis to solve the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, within the coming two years. And always take a deep breath and look around for the vodka bottle that I haven't brought. Um, but it's, it's, it's really a different ballgame. Uh, and I feel terribly sorry for John Kerry, who I think is a good guy and tries very hard. But time in the Middle East works differently. And therefore, one shouldn't give up. That's the challenge in the Middle East. Our clock is a different clock from the American clock. Our clock runs slower, but it doesn't mean we have to give up on any of these challenges. And somehow or other, we have to deal, we have to solve the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Now, there's a consensus in Israel, by the way, not necessarily with the government, but the population in Israel, the majority of Israelis have been shown on many, many surveys and many frameworks that there is a, a, is a real desire for peace. And there's a, a real desire for giving up territory. By the way, that doesn't mean that that brings peace necessarily. And I personally often use the term reduce conflict. We have to reduce our conflict. I want to say something about the Palestinians because there's a danger of um, dehumanizing them. It can happen. They're bad Palestinians. Some of them want to kill us. But I mean other Palestinians. And I was in Ramallah some time ago. And I must admit I had a very awkward feeling. I met such wonderful Palestinians there that I, my main wish, I wish they were Jews. Uh, because they were terrific. We met heads of banks, and we met some entrepreneurs, and we met some absolutely fabulous people, and we disagreed most of the time. But they were just wonderful human beings. And I think what we have to say about the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, and it is a real crisis, that when we sort it out, both sides gain. This is a venture which is to the benefit of both sides. And I want to tell you what a Palestinian colleague once said to me, and it was quite a shock. He said, we're going to disagree with each other for a long time. But we Palestinians know that when push comes to shove, the only group of people in this world who really want to us to And it took me a few years to understand what he meant, and I think he was right. The Palestinians are a tragic people. They're supported verbally by who knows who. Everyone in the world supports about the Palestinians. But very few people have really done much to really help the Palestinians. And to help the Palestinians is to build their society, and build schools, and build hospitals, and build institutions. And that is really what the Palestinians need. And when we eventually get to that stage, um, it's going to be very good uh, for both sides. I want to conclude on two additional challenges which we have. We have the BDS, the uh, Boycott of Israel Movement. I meet many of the BDS people. Um, I'm very worried about boycott movements, generally. Firstly, I'll ask myself when I hear, read about the boycott of Israel movement, um, are we in Israel the worst of 196 countries? Um, are they establishing a BDS against Russia, which is doing some nasty things in Ukraine, apparently? You see, when Israel is chosen as the object of boycott and divestment, I always just have to have this very, very awkward feeling of why we are the chosen group. And I don't have a comfortable feeling about it. Now, I want to say that it's legitimate to criticize Israel. 
legitimate to criticize the United States. But the same BDS people, when they criticize America, do they boycott the United States because they don't like American policy in uh, Iraq in the, in the earlier period? Or they don't like American drone policy uh, in, in Yemen? Uh, a few days ago, 30, some 36 uh, Yemen people were killed by an American drone, which might be legitimate. I'm not talking about the right or wrong of it. But the fact that there is this need to constantly brand Israel as the object of evil makes me feel very, very uncomfortable. Once again, criticism is okay. I've got my criticism. On the bad days in Israel, I'm looking for another Jewish country to live in, but I've got nowhere to go. So I stick around where I am, where I actually happen to be happy most of the time. But it, it, it is a serious issue, by the way, not because they're going to destroy Israel. Their real power is limited. But I'm worried about something else, and that's the bullying concept. You see, you don't bully a country that can have a response. So you don't threaten China. You know, you can have any impact. And you don't threaten Russia. And you don't threaten any of the other big countries. But you have, in, in the case of Israel, a group of 0.2% of the world. The whole Jewish group is 14 million. We have many friends, many, many friends in the world. But the core group is of 0.2%. It's easy to bully that group. And I'm very worried about that phenomenon. It's bullying little kid on the block, which isn't such a good idea. You see, when we are in Israel, we see ourselves as a little kid in a small country surrounded by 350 million people who may not necessarily like us. The status of Israel in the world has always been very, very low. We shouldn't think it suddenly developed. You know, straight after the State of Israel was established, there was an Arab boycott movement of Israel. This is before we had the territories, by the way. This was before I arrived in the Six Day War to make sure that Israel won. There, there we were, without it was the small state of Israel. There was this major boycott of Israel movement. So it isn't that if we give back the territories that the world is going to love us. You see, we have very little real power. 0.2%. So it's easy to bully us. So sometimes with, within the BDS, and I'm meeting these people in various parts of the world, I, once again, I just can't stop myself coming out with the question of, is it a genuine concept, or does it have some other connotation? By the way, most of them are liars, because they said they're not going to use any Israeli products. But if they don't use any product that Israel makes, they might as well live on a desert island. Israeli products are everywhere. And whenever I tell them what they've just out of their pocket or whatever they're doing, made in Israel, somewhere in, the, in that from, um, uh, technical instrument they have. Um, so it, it, it isn't, it isn't uh, uh, totally uh, honest. Um, the alienation of young Jews towards Israel. It's, it's very interesting. I, I think the problem is greater than just the alienation of young Jews to Israel. I think there's the issue of alienation of young Jews to Judaism. It's global. Wherever I go, I'm traveling around the world. Uh, you mentioned 13 countries, it's actually now 22. Uh, so I've done in the last few years a lot of extra, a lot of extra traveling, a lot of extra workshops, a lot of extra study. I do a lot of study because I've really got nothing to do with my free time. Um, so uh, that's, that's really uh, uh, an issue. So the alienation of, of young Jews, I think it's, don't think it's only towards Israel, it's towards collective concepts. And clearly, one has to ask the question of Iran. I want to give two approaches. One approach appeared in an article uh, with a colleague, written by a colleague of mine, but we've been speaking together for many years, about how, you, what, how we should understand Iran. And his concept, this is Professor David Menashe, who's really uh, maybe one of the best Iran watchers in the world, to be honest. He maintains that the attitude of the Iranian government to Israel 
is part of internal Iranian crisis, where mainstream Iranian Tehran society is very modern, very well developed. I know I've met many people uh, um, from Iran over the years, and they've said, wow, don't think that the Iranian population is, is like the Khomeini crowd. It's, it's not the Ayatollah crowd. We are modern Western people, and I myself have met many of them in various occasions in, in Europe. Um, and, and there's this internal crisis in Iran. And David Menashri's uh, comment and his article, very good article, was basically based on the concept that in the internal crisis within Iranian society, the radical group has to pick up something which incites the masses. And the anger towards the big Satan, which is America, and the little Satan, which in Israel has really brought about a great deal of this very, very uh, violent uh, uh, language, which one has to take seriously. The other component of the Iranian crisis is the following. Um, when push comes to shove, uh, Israel has a military alternative. I certainly hope we don't ever have to get to it. But there are many, many stages before that. Now, some of it are not friendly stuff. You know, I was, uh, as I mentioned, an uninvited guest in 1982. Wars are terrible things. So one has to do everything you can before you get to it. Israel has a, a technique which is not nice, so please, I'm not talking about nice things, where senior scientists sometimes fall off their motorbikes and die. I don't know how it happens on a number of occasions. What I'm saying is you have to think very creatively. You have to work out in the world we're living in how to pressure without causing mass deaths. That is going to be the challenge of the future. Because we're going to have tremendous power. Mass of the countries are going to have nuclear power. So we're going to have to work out other kind of mechanisms. So I'm very concerned about Iran. All Israelis are. We don't know exactly what the Iranian position is. Um, I do believe, by the way, that it is a case where world sanctions have an effect. A lot of Iranians say that they've suffered a great deal by it. Um, but, uh, but as I say, you know, I would certainly hope that, that countries of the world, including Israel, in cooperation with Israel, uh, we work out different mechanisms of pressure which would defuse uh, some of the issues. Um, in Israel, we can't wake up every morning worrying about what's going to happen with Iran because we don't know enough about it. We have to be pre uh, proactive. I want to conclude with something um, which had a tremendous impact on me. And this is two little experiences that I had uh, in Lebanon when I was there in 1982. Um, I'm not a very good soldier, I'll be honest. I get bored very quickly, and soldiering has never been my strong point. And I was uh, in Lebanon, 1982, in the southern part of Lebanon, and Rabbi and I were talking about the dinner, uh, uh, in the, it's an area of Nabatea. It's the cap center of the Shiites. Now, the Shiites have a very, very uh, problematic, uh, from my perspective, um, holiday, which is called the Ashura Festival, when they remember the event of 680, which was a conflict between the Sunnis and the Shiites, where as part of the Shiite festival, they now take stones and razors and bang their heads, and blood comes out. By the way, I used to teach this course uh, at university, and it was the course where most of the students missed that class, because I had terrible movies, and they knew it was going to come. So I suddenly found most of them were sick on a certain uh, Tuesday. Uh, very, very uh, tough stuff. Thanks, sorry. Um, so. Um, there I was uh, in, in Lebanon, and um, um, two very interesting events happened to me. And it, it both depressed me and gave me tremendous hope. And this, I'll conclude my comments, and then would like to get in discussion with you. Um, I was in this uh, communications unit, and in my particular unit, we had a lot of uh, contact with the Maronite Christians, who at that time were allies of Israel. You know, in the Middle East, uh, allies, friends and allies and enemies change twice a week. And it's all about survival. So don't look for 
There's, there's the only thing consistent about the Middle East is the inconsistency. So I, you get a handle on it. And uh, it was a moment of history when the Maronites were our friend, and they were a very efficient militia. And I happened to become a friend of a Maronite uh, major. He was a terrific uh, fellow, and uh, he was very interested in history, and I was interested in history. And we bumped into each other and really chatted, and we became good friends. And um, there was one uh, event which has remained very, very powerful uh, with me. Uh, he lived in a village, a Maronite Christian village, above the Shiite city of Nabatea. And in a very ethnic country like Lebanon, everyone is so aware of who they are and what their identity was. And one day he invited me up to the village, um, and uh, we were sitting on his, in the, the lawn next to the house. And it was very beautiful, and he had the grapevines and fruit trees, and it was beautiful. And we had the following conversation. I've cut down the discussion. You know, in Middle East conversations are about seven times longer than anywhere else, and you've only got through the introduction. So the shortened version is as follows. We're talking and talking, and I say to him, I understand you have some problems with the Shiites down in the valley. And he says, no problem, no problem. So I say, well, can we talk about it? And anyway, once you've said something five times in the Middle East, uh, you know it's a discussion topic. So after I'd gone through the natural process of saying that I wasn't giving up the topic, he realized that I was a real pain, you know, and I wasn't going to give up too quickly. And he said the following. He said, no, we have no problem with the Shiites. And I'll tell you, he said, um, I said to him that the problem is that apparently every now and again, the electricity in the village goes off. And the reason the electricity breaks is that the electricity line went through Nabatea, through the Shiite city of Nabatea, and they would literally turn off the electricity. And I thought that was a problem. And then I learned a great deal about the Middle East. He said to me, look, it's not a problem. And he said, just go under those vines over there, and I go over there, and there I see a massive machine gun. I wonder, what's it doing here? I said, what's this about? He said, when the electricity goes off, one of the family members goes to the machine gun. We shoot down for about five minutes into Nabatea, and then the electricity comes on. You see, we have no problem. <laughs> now, it took me about five years to get my head around that one, but it was a very, very significant comment different cultural norms in different parts of the world that one has to come to terms with. Well, my, conflict, my contact with this uh, 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 Maronite friend was a great learning experience for me, but that particular story was a little bit hard for someone like me. But the other story I want to uh, conclude my presentation with was a totally different event. As part of my being such a board uh, soldier, and I was in this uh, uh, communications unit, we would have shifts of about six hours a day, and then nothing else to do. We'd have to go into a communication center for about six hours a day, and then we were free. And I always like to sort of learn about wherever I am. So um, I decided that I'd get to speak to the Lebanese. Now, the only problem with getting to speak to the Lebanese was in the middle of a war. So it wasn't such a great idea. But I, I realized that just over the main road from where our army base was, was in an abandoned, uh, tobacco factory, uh, there was a Lebanese people in a little shop there. I thought, this is a good opportunity. I mean, how often am I going to be invited to Lebanon? Probably not on too many occasions. So let me take advantage. So I go over the road. It was a little uh, grocery store, very small grocery store. So I go over for the first day, and I'm in my Israeli army uniform with a gun. And as time went by, and I went back a few times, the first time I went to so the second time I went over with a gun, but without any bullets. And then I thought, am I going to use this? I might as well take a broom. I mean, what's a good uh, gun without bullets? So the second or third time I went, just in my Israeli army uniform without a gun. And I got to know a Lebanese family. Fascinating, fascinating. Mother, father, and two children. Very, very nice, simple people. We used to talk. And after a few visits, I thought we should make some Middle Eastern agreement. Because you have to move on in the Middle East. And the agreement was as follows. 
I would teach the two children, the girl was about nine and the boy was about seven, I would be their private English teacher, but there has to be payment in the Middle East. And the payment was that they would give me a dry coat, a, a warm coat, not a dry coat, a warm coat. That was the agreement. By the way, for them to give me a coat, they had such a little money, it was a, it was a kind of investment. It doesn't sound as if that's true, but that's really what their economic position was. And I went over two, three times a week, and I'd go and teach these two kids a little bit of English. We'd sit in their little grocery store, and I'd go back. By the way, um, my officer, in my, uh, I was uh, a sergeant, but my Israeli army officer, was very upset about it. And he said, you're in the middle of the war. You know, this is breaking military rules. You can't go and sort of get friendly with the locals. And I told him, if I don't get friendly with the locals, I'm going to be so bored, I'm going to be no good to anyone. So he knew me quite well. Afterwards, many years ago, he was a student in one of my classes. And he walked into the class and said, oh, you may, I didn't realize this was my teacher. <laughs> so he remembered me from the old time. But the important thing was what happened in this relationship. And um, one Friday, after having given my private lesson, I went back to the base, and we suddenly got, uh, it was, uh, we, I'd been in Lebanon a few weeks, we suddenly got instructions that we would, could go home, to our homes, uh, for an extended weekend, because things were quiet, and so, you know, we quickly got on the, uh, the trucks, and we were taken back to Lebanon, I went back, taken back to Israel, sorry, I went back to Israel for a few days, and that was the day before cell phones, so it was really very exciting to the family, and um, I spent some time with the family, and then came back to the base, and um, got back to the base, and then had a bit of time, so I started crossing the road. Now this is the city of the Shiites, and it was a very busy road. I'm walking over the road, over this road, and by the way, in Lebanon, uh, no one has any uh, recognition of street lights or anything like that, or even you can drive, drive on any side of the road. It's all acceptable as long as you stay alive. Uh, so it's this crazy way of crossing a road, and you don't know from which side you're going to be attacked. And I'm crossing this road, I'm in the middle of the road, there was a little bit of concrete which is supposed to divide the, the different directions. And the four of them come, run across the road, and hug me. Now, we have to see what we're talking about. Middle of the war, a guy in Israeli army uniform is hugged by these four Lebanese. And then what the father said, I've never forgotten. He said, are we happy to see you safe and sound? We thought that those darn Shiites had killed you. And you know, that's given me hope until today. That somehow or other, we're going to work things out in the Middle East. I don't always know how, and I certainly don't know when, but that has to be our goal. We have to live in better situations for the good of everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our rule with uh, all adult ed is 90 minutes, so we have a half hour for uh, give and take. Please, fire away. Please. So with the Lebanese, we spoke in three languages, English, French, and Arabic. So we would just alternate. My Arabic, uh, my, my, I can understand a fair amount. My spoken Arabic isn't so good, but with the three languages, we went meant to communicate. That's absolutely true. The question was, Israel is the only country in the world, in history, that has willingly taken in uh, black citizens. It's actually true. It's actually true. Uh, by the way, it hasn't been an easy project, even in Israel. Um, it's uh, the, uh, the cultural differences between people coming from Ethiopia, coming to the modern West societies, uh, are still issues we deal with. But, but it is very, very important. It's a very important project, and I'm Please, we've done it. Uh, you know, it's the right thing to do. And um, I just, uh, uh, we, we, there have been some very big bumps in it because there's the, the, the group who are defined as Jews, and then there's a group called the Palashmura who 
who come from uh, different backgrounds. So it's, it's been a difficult project, but it was absolutely the right thing to do. And you know, you know, we use the expression of uh, life unto the nations. Um, I think all groups are life unto other nations. Uh, and, and I think we come from a, a background, uh, starting with the Bible and all the way through, which means we should be just that much more aware of the challenges facing us. And I think this is really one of the projects which we did right, and hopefully it's been to the advantage, and the message to other groups as well. Thank you very much for being here. Please. is really who's, who's on whose side in tough situations. I think that, that's the point. Um, you know, I've lived in Israel 47 years now, and when push comes to shove, I think we have to look after ourselves. Um, countries have their own interests, and I think that's a reality. Um, I, 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 I'm not a cynical, and I don't believe that we're alone in the world. I, I think we, must, we mustn't move into that. that. That's also very dangerous. In Israel, we can suddenly say, you know, we've got no friends on any kind of uh, situation. Um, but I think when push comes to shove, countries have to uh, take the responsibility for their own actions, hoping that other friends who declare their friendship over the years uh, will be there. I think most Israelis would agree with what I've just said, uh, that we do have friends, but you, you know, let me tell you the classic case study which has affected everyone in the world. And this was Great Britain, the great, great Britain, you know, when Britain was really great, although the British still believe they are, but it might not be true anymore. But I, the, the famous uh, uh, case study is the uh, case study of Czechoslovakia. Czechs uh, the British were committed to protecting Czechoslovakia. And when push came to shove and the Nazis moved into Czechoslovakia, Chamberlain, the great Chamberlain, suddenly managed to forget, and he used the following expression, that little country somewhere in Central Europe, and basically it's their problem. I think we found enough case studies in modern history to actually realize that when push comes to shove, countries have to uh, depend on themselves. Um, I, I would always hope that promises are promises, but I would never, always expect that to be the case. So I think that is really uh, uh, what we have to do. Now just in terms generally of, of relationships, we have an excellent relationship with American military. Although we disagree sometimes with the political realms, uh, with the American military, the Israeli military. Uh, you know, by the way, I even remember in my little unit, and I was, was certainly a, a low-level soldier, uh, we were providing a tremendous amount of information to the American army about American equipment. So it, it's, um, you know, it's not a one-sided, these relationships are not one-sided. They're, they're benefits to both sides. So I think that is real. So it's very important to kind of uh, recognize it from that perspective. You help each other in, in different ways. So um, I, I hopefully on that basis, uh, countries will help each other. I'm quite amazed, by the way, I live in a very uh, uh, complex, uh, we all live in a complex period when we realize that um, in some ways on the political level, Israel's greatest two friends in Europe at the moment are Germany and Poland. Now, if my wife's grandmother was alive, I mean, I, I don't know how I would have got out of that one. You know, that would have been oil lake about five times every seven seconds. So uh, it's very, we live in this world, I think survival today is about being one step ahead, and I'm very much committed to the concept of being proactive. 
You can't wait for events to dictate to you. You have to be out there looking, expecting, thinking, uh, and I think that's what survival is, uh, is very much about. Um, yeah, there's a question here. Yeah. yeah. All the way from where you came from. I mean, you're allowed to ask as many questions as you want. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, let, let me speak about the Jordanian issue uh, first. Um, the creation of Jordan is an artificial creation. It was created by the British uh, in 1922. It was based on the British were on the side of the Hashemite families in Saudi Arabia against the Ibn Saud family. The Ibn Saud family had, uh, had um, got involved um, uh, with, um, with some of the enemies of England at that time. Uh, so uh, Britain felt committed to helping the Hashemites, and they basically gave three of the brothers bits of land, of which uh, Jordan uh, was one of them, uh, given to King Abdullah, Abdullah the first. Um, the, the, the indigenous population of Jordan is basically Palestinian. It belongs to Palestina, which is the uh, Roman definition of the wide area of Israel, West Bank, and, and uh, Jordan. Um, Jordan um, has had a very ambivalent relationship to the Palestinians. Because in Jordan, you have what you have in other countries of the world, which is a minority government. So the Hashemites are only 30%. They control uh, the area. Their whole attitude towards the Palestinians, firstly, was based on the idea that they can control the Palestinians. And at a later stage, only after 1967, in fact, only in the 1980s, did the Jordanians realize that they didn't want to control the Palestinians, and they would rather the Israelis deal with the problem. So they handed over the, they, they gave up on the Palestinian issue in the area of the West Bank. So it's really based all the time on uh, what is a, kind of the fundamental terminology of the Middle East, which is the politics of survival. Jordanian attitudes towards Palestinians is how the Jordanians can carry on existing. So therefore, it was no, they gave up on the, they gave up the Palestinian controlled area of West Bank when it was politically a survival, it's a survival issue from their perspective. And in an earlier period of history, they thought they were strong enough to control them. So that's the whole is the Jordanian, Palestinian, Israeli, Israeli issue. By the way, Israel and Jordan has very good relations. Not because we agree with them, but Israel is, is so crucial to Jordan's survival. Jordan doesn't have too many allies in the world. Very popular in the Western world. Partly because their English is so darn good, I get embarrassed in listening to them. Uh, they all speak as if they've come out of Oxford and Cambridge, as does the, the present king. He's uh, spent most of his life out of Jordan. Uh, his English is absolutely fantastic. Um, but um, th that is really what this whole kind of situation. Palestinian crisis, by the way, is that they're looked at with suspicion by every Arab society, but in terms of propaganda, they're exploited by every Arab society, and yet none of them really have gained by any Arab society. So it's this, it's this mixed, uh, uh, mixed gambit. Before I just get to your first question about Hamas and um, and uh, the, the Fatah group, the PLO, um, I've got a very, very good uh, uh, Arab, Israeli Arab friend of mine, and we were on a panel about a year ago, and uh, he was saying some of the things where Israeli Arab citizens have a rough time in Israel, and I agree with him. So one of the people in the audience said, you know, I've just listened to you, and if you feel things are so bad for you in Israel, um, why don't you leave Israel and go somewhere else? So he made a very interesting comment. He said, well, I really don't want to live in Europe or America. And he said, there's actually no country in the Middle East that I'd ever want to go and live in. So I'll stick around in Israel. So it's this, that's why I say, you know, Palestinian people, wherever they live, are actually caught up by some very, very difficult issues. In terms of the, the 
the relationship between the West Bank Palestinians and the Gaza Palestinian. Um, my reading of Middle Eastern history is don't believe anything you read, analyze it 10 years later. Uh, so whereas in the Western world you read something and actually believe it, when you spend enough time studying Middle Eastern history, you, you don't pay any attention to it until about 10 years down the line. Um, the differences are tremendous. West are West by and large, Western looking, forward looking, by and large have a positive attitude towards their uh, female uh, uh, members of the community, um, travel, studied at Western universities, by the way, if we put away politics and the tensions, it's, it's, it's very, very comfortable to sit and speak to those people. I had a, a Palestinian friend from Bethlehem. He was terrific. Uh, he was a professor at the Bethlehem University. He had an excellent expense account. And he would always invite me to have a discussion during lunchtime. Uh, and lunch in Bethlehem was always wonderful. Um, but uh, uh, he, we would have an amazing, it was quite, it was quite re remarkable. First we would insult each other for 10 minutes, and then we would actually uh, get down to some important discussions. Um, I don't think this reality between those West Bankers and the uh, Gaza people is as nearly as easy as they talk about. Gaza is much more Islamic, much more, it's not Al-Qaeda, but it's much, there are many of the main Palestinian thinkers in Gaza believe in the return of the Caliphate, the, the, the period of, after Muhammad there were four leaders of the Caliphs of the four, four leaders, and a lot of um, Gazan ideological thinking is based on the greater Islamic State idea, uh, which West Bankers just have no uh, kind of understanding for. I think what it comes about is a kind of a deep anxiety among the West Bank uh, Palestinian leaders who don't know how to get out of the situation that they're in. Uh, partly because they don't play their politics well. You know, there would have been a Palestinian state in, in 1948. Uh, it was called the Arab state. That, that's what it would have been. And, and they, they didn't realize. They, they, um, uh, uh, the late Abba Eben, the, the famous uh, Israeli foreign minister, said, you know, never, uh, no group like the Palestinians has uh, lost so many opportunities, you know. They, they just uh, succeeded at that. Um, so I, I think that is what this whole situation, they're, they're, they're deep legal problems, and that is, if the Palestinians want to get into the United Nations, and they together with Hamas, Hamas is defined as a terrorist organization, and the UN by its own legal system cannot allow a terrorist organization to become a member. So there's some other issues there as well. But as I say, I think it's very, very early to know exactly what it means uh, in reality. You know, the, um, the, the whole dynamics of, of language in the Middle East is, is, is very different. So it's not a great answer, but it's, it's the most honest that I can uh, give at this moment here. Yes. Our lady from New York. Uh, you had mentioned uh, alienation. Uh, I'm not sure whether you were referring to alienation of in Israel or alienation of in the diaspora. Uh huh. Good. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Good. Okay. I, I... What you say to those Great. who are disillusioned Good. because of. In, in the particular situation, what I, the context I was speaking about earlier, I was thinking more about Jews in the wider world, young Jews in the wider world, who are finding it harder to deal with uh, the, the contemporary uh, religious structure. So that's what I was referring to. In Israeli society, you also have alienation. Uh, you have alienation because it's a generation issue. Um, you have alienation, which we haven't even started to touch, but. If any of you are coming uh, to dinner tomorrow evening, I'll go into this more detail. Uh, you have alienation between the various um, Jewish religious groups on different levels. I personally think the position is getting better than it used to be. Uh, I think there's, there, there are good signs that are out there um, as well. Um, the, um, there's, there's, there's other uh, 
problems of alienation in Israeli society, by the way, I, I think there's something which is very worrying, and we have to be honest about this, and that is the radicalization of uh, small groups of very right-wing Jews living in the territories who are acting in ways towards Christians and Muslims in a totally unacceptable manner. And, and that once again, what we spoke about the, in the Islamic society, uh, small groups in Islam, it's 10%, I think, in Israel, the percentage is smaller, but at the same time, very, very dangerous. When governments don't recognize the potential negative power of radical groups, the governments are responsible. So I don't like what they're doing, but, but they're allowed to get away with it. And there is a lot of discussion going in Israel. There are a lot of very, very influential people who are asking the following question. How can we allow a group, they call the Hilltop Youth, who live in the territories, to go and daub something against a mosque? I mean, have we no historical memory of why that, what happens when you do that sort of thing? So I think, you know, that in Israel we have these the, uh, the danger of, of the certain right-wing groups, which are actually alienating the majority. And it's an interesting mirror image of, I think, what we see in certain uh, Islamic societies. On the whole, I think Israeli society has the advantage of there's some collective basic concepts which I can keep us together. I think they're there. I think they're understood. Um, you know, people often say to me, but look how many Israelis live out of Israel. And I say, free will. People must live where they want to live. I really believe that in my heart of hearts. Um, Israel is a tough sort of part of the, 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 the world to live in. But I think as long as we have certain realms of consensus, it, it, it's very important. At the same time, we have behavior which is alienating behavior, which personally, personally worries me tremendously. And I, I, quite honestly, um, I cannot forgive any government which sees this kind of behavior happening and does nothing about it. And I, I don't care what the possible reasons might be, but it's just unacceptable. And I think we should be aware of that and say it. And you know, that's, that's important. Yeah, just one. You can't be in Israel without a bridge. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was a difficult book to take, in, and uh, there was a lot of dirty laundry that I did not know was not the narrative of the laundry. And um, I recommended the book to my stepson, who's 24, oh, he was a, he was a complete clean slate there for nothing. And my thought was, there's so much negativity on college campuses and everything, it might well clear the dirty laundry Before we get from the Jewish come. source and come to terms with it. But I did have kind of funny feelings about it, like is this really what I should be recommending as a first book? And I just wondered, Great. is the book Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. 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 And I, I had the same feeling. Uh, Arish Habit's book is important. It's an important book. By the way, it's a very important book for an interesting reason. We've grown up. We can now write tough books about ourselves and look at ourselves in the mirror as we really are. And that's a very freeing moment. As depressed as I was to read the book, and you're speaking about particularly the section on Lida, which is a horrendous section. Um, you know, I, I've been studying wars for the last 50 years, and you know, Jews, Jewish fighters are fighters in wars, and the role of a war is to win, and it's very tough and very dirty. And so I think it's actually a maturing moment to say that this is what will say. I want to say something else about the book. It, it shouldn't be taken out of context. Uh, I had a writer critique on it uh, the other day, uh, and, and in my critique on it I said, uh, Ari Shavit uh, wanted to write a book which he had spent a long time preparing, uh, which he would make sure that enough people would read it to make it worthwhile, and on that he succeeded. But he's a great patriot of Israel. He's a great patriot of Israel. 
But he said some of the tough things. And I don't think you can write about war anywhere, anywhere, without, without really recognizing that some, to win a war you do some, some terrible things. I would never give it as the only book to read on Israel. Okay, Tara, I'm a dry historian. There's a most amazing book, but you have to be a, a, a citizen who loves pain uh, by Sachar, S-A-C-H-A-R, called The History of Israel. It's a massive, it's actually interesting, it's only available in, in English and you don't have the equivalent in Hebrew. So it's in English, it's up there. It's a very serious historical analysis. It's kind of mainstream attempt to understand the multi-level uh, components which are out there. By the way, I would say something else. In terms of learning about Israel, um, and uh, we were talking, uh, talking with the, to Jan about this with Jan this afternoon, um, Israeli movies. What do Israeli movies say? It says we are a free people. We are producing movies which are so complex and so painful that one and the same time can actively delight me as well as my wife's late grandmother. There's an oibe component and there's a freeing component. And I think that is what we have to recognize. As part of our maturity, we will be bringing up many of the issues. You know, it's the same story with the United States. You remember when Lincoln was thought to be the greatest guy on earth? And then suddenly after a few books, he wasn't so great. It's okay. That's humanity. And when people used to teach Bible stories but take out some of the important parts of King David, wasn't so good either. He wasn't such a great guy either. So let us teach that in a subtle way within our, in our Torah classes. But I think that is really what I think one has to understand by Ari Shavit. I think it's about the movies coming out. I think it's about the poetry. I think it's about the writing by David Grossman. I think it's certainly about Amos Oz's remarkable autobiography which I would also recommend, uh, is uh, um, the autobiography is just quite remarkable. So I think it's the combination of a complex, evolving society, which has to be part of the reading of people trying to involve themselves in Israel, and most of all, visiting the country. So I put all those on Before we about. close, uh, on behalf of those who weren't able to attend, tonight's the only talk on the external threats to Israel starting tomorrow at noon, uh, a, a great session. It's at 12, isn't it? Uh, and then tomorrow evening, you've heard about Judaism and the Jewish state, following services, you're all invited to dinner. But just let Jan know, she's the boss. Uh, on behalf of those who didn't come, the senator from Arizona, uh, Senator Malkin. Uh, <laughs> and this may be an unfair question, Professor, but why do American Jews in particular seem to fear Iran even more than you do tonight? Mm. Or, and, 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 is the question clear? Uh, you, you, yeah. you, you, you've moved to the internal threats, which we're really going to talk about the rest, but the external threats seem to dominate. Good. I, I believe. Well, what's your read on that from your travels? I believe that what affects us is often the unstated. American society was traumatized by 1979 and the kidnapping of American diplomats held in Iran where the great America has absolutely no way of getting out of it. There is a hidden, deep fear of Iran which permeates American society and which I think is still there today. Well, that's the Holocaust and they're going to do it to us again and, and far be it from me, I'm not a survivor. I, I, yeah, yeah, I, 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 you see, uh, no, 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 because I think we know what our power is. We know that when push comes to shove, we hope we never have to use it. We can today defend ourselves as we never could in the past. But America does carry with it, by the way, in interesting ways, kind of deep memories of weakness. And I'm not an expert on American psychology, but I'm totally convinced that one could have a great university force on American inability to deal honestly with many components of, their, of your own history which have had impact in unexpected ways on how you look at the world. 
and it's Vietnam, and some stuff that went on in South America, and there are a whole lot of other events in American history, which I don't know, even a country, and I think you're a very honest society, I'm not always sure that even you have, uh, have dealt with, us, with that. In the case of, of, of Israel, by the way, we have a very interesting uh, mechanism. We don't have a sanitarian committee, which means we can do the things we want to do without explaining it to the enemy before we've done it. And I think, therefore, in a certain sense, the Israeli dynamic is kind of a very honest reality of what we can do. Whereas in America, your diplomat, your democratic process is a great process, but you're in the wrong moment and the wrong planet of the world. And the addendum on American Jews is particular. And American Jews are because I think very sensitive and I think care about Israel and it's a mechanism it is a serious issue to care, and it's something which is very clear. It's very much part of the American psyche. So it's kind of an issue which is an American issue as well, whereas in a strange kind of way, or maybe not so strange, uh, Israel is an is a action-oriented society. And because we know we can act, hopefully we won't have to, I think in a sense it almost reduces some of the, of the pressure. But I think it's fascinating. Okay. Yeah, good. To help Israel. Come and listen to my lectures. I mean, that's the best thing for anyone, so I'm delighted you came. So it's part of the process. Uh, what can you do to help? I want to say something which I feel very strongly in my heart. Um, it goes back to statistics 0.2%. When you're a member of a small group, it does, there's not, not only one answer to this. Ensuring the growth, but it's not just survival. It's the effervescent, positive growth of your group in any definition. And there are a lot of different definitions. is extremely important. I want to conclude with something which I held strong, maybe because it's a, it's a family issue. Um, I never knew any grandparents of mine. I come from a tragic family, by the way. In my family, all people who died, but they died all, which was Rhodesia. The Rhodesia was African diseases and everything else. But I once found out that a, a grandfather of mine, who I never met, had actually written a letter to uh, Yisrael Zangma, who was the territorialist, didn't believe the Jewish state, believed in, in Jewish territory, and he actually wrote to Zangbal and said, Mr. Zangbal, I know you're looking for a suitable territory for the Jewish state. I would like to suggest Angola. I'm delighted that my grandfather failed. But what I'm saying is that I think that little letter of his was in his own way an expression of concern and wanting to help. Whatever one does in any community of the world, which is somehow or other part of this chain of continuation, um, but it isn't just continuation on the lowest level. It has to be continuation on a creative level. That's why I'm a great believer in education, and in art, and literature, and all those kind of things. What you can do here is to be part of a big picture. You know, I personally chose to live in Israel. I made the, the right choice. But I don't believe it's where you live which is important. What's really important is what you feel and what you do. And so I say wherever we live, what one does and what one feels really makes us, I think, who we are today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. professor standing, it's 5 a.m. He lectured from 3.30 a.m. to 5 a.m. Israeli time, just getting off the plane. We hope you get some rest tonight for tomorrow's three talks. Thanks to the Burr Stern Fund for bringing you, and thanks to all of you for being here today.